we are live now i am chandrakanta rathor coordinator for this session a very warm welcome to the tsdsi tech deep dive 2023 session 6 before we begin i would like to highlight a few hygiene instruction for ensuring the smooth running of this session all attendees will be kept on mute throughout the session by default if you have any questions for the speakers please type them in a q and a tab you may interact with fellow attendees live using the chat tab during the session if you want to enlarge your own screen presentation please click the expanding arrow icon on the top right of the presenting screen the tool is configured for hd video the attendees may switch to ld in case you are facing any bandwidth problems this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the tstsi website within the next few days attendees may like to visit the exhibit booth of the tstsi in between the session to know more about our work attendees can use the lounge facility for networking the lounge will remain open till the end of the conference now i would like to introduce the convener of the session Mr Vijay Madan is currently associated with TSTSI as advisor and mentor with special focus on standardization in services and solutions relating to evolving technologies and applications vertical sector use cases security and crypto iot drone services cloud computing ppdr future ict enabling system also with jwg's focus connected with 1m2m 3gpp and itt Now I invite Mr. Vijay Madan to introduce the session co-chairs. Sir, over to you now. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Wherever you are from different parts of the world. Thank you very much. Thank speakers, chairs, and uh, all the panelists to this edition of uh, the Tech Deep Dive last session. where we are discussing security for 60 challenges and uh, uh, other related aspects uh, i like to introduce uh, to our eminent co-chairs dr manikan srinivasan currently works at nec corporation of india uh, that is neci and holds a title as assistant general manager Uh, at NECI, Dr. Mani Kantan is involved in 5G and beyond related research. Oran Alliance Architecture and 5G Solution Pro Development, Tele Telecom Security, 3GPP Standardization Initiatives, and Cyber Threat Intelligence Support System. Uh, Doctor, I have. i am really pleased to introduce dr n subramaniam is serving as executive director sets cts since november 2020, 2022 prior to jo joining sets he has served in center for development of advanced computing cdac pune and head as head and senior director corporate r&d so we have two two very eminent chairs and also similarly we have panelists speakers and thanks the audience who have joined us over to you dr manikantan thank you um <clears throat> uh, good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you are and warm welcome to this uh, tech day dive and session on uh, cyber security security for 6g challenges and approaches uh, so i would like to uh, just give a, a abstract basically an idea of what this session is about um and then we will move forward so we all know uh, like you all know that the world is looking for the next generation in the mobile uh, networks from 4g it was a uh, significant advancement that we came into 5g but now when we consider 6g it is being envisioned as an evolution like how 4g was an evolved from 3g so 6g is going to be a major evolution that is going to bring in a seamless reality uh, where there will be a merging of physical and digital worlds of today 
while in 5g networks also security was strengthened with various aspects such as uh, zero trust architecture enforced encrypted communication to ensure confidentiality integrity etc for users and data um, in 6g uh, the deployments are going to leverage uh, many technologies both your current and upcoming technologies when we say uh, upcoming technologies, uh, the current and upcoming technologies like post-quantum cryptography, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, enhanced edge computing, molecular communications, uh, terahertz, visible light communication, uh, digital ledger technologies, etc., uh, which leverages uses blockchain. So 6G networks being different and utilizing various technologies, both current and upcoming, the security that is required is going to be uh, also totally different and challenging. So we would need novel authentication, encryption mechanisms, access control mechanisms to handle any malicious activity detected at the earliest, uh, bring in required privacy, uh, ensure stringent security in the 6G networks, etc. The quantum is going to play a major role, uh, quantum, uh, both quantum networks and quantum security part. So the 6G networks, which is expected to be available in, uh, in 20, 20, seven years from now. So we'll have multiple aspects to be taken care. So in this session, we have um, two keynotes provided by eminent uh, speakers uh, from, uh, I'll introduce the speakers. Um, the first uh, will be providing an end-to-end -end overview of security uh, in the 6G space, what is needed. And then the second keynote uh, is on quantum communication. In addition to that, we'll be having a panel session uh, where we have five uh, panel members and moderated by Dr. Subramaniam from SETS, uh, who would be uh, discussing uh, the security from the multiple perspectives. So let me introduce the first keynote speaker. Uh, so Professor Huzur Saran is uh, from IIT Delhi. He currently heads the Department of Computer Science uh, at IIT Delhi. So prior to IIT Delhi joining IIT Delhi in 1990, he finished his computer science uh, research from University of California, Berkeley in 89. Uh, his BTEC uh, degree was from IIT Delhi in 1983. So uh, now I hand over the session to our first keynote speaker, Professor Sharon. We look forward to hear from you uh, the aspects of security for 6G end to end. Thank you uh, uh, for inviting me to speak at this event. Uh, uh, let me just correct that presently I am heading the Bharti School of Telecom Technology. I was head of computer science a few years ago, uh, but otherwise uh, the, uh, everything is as already announced. So uh, I was asked to speak about uh, sort of set the stage for the discussion in this session on what's the challenge of security in 6G, what is new here and uh, what approaches we need. Of course, security is a perennial problem. It has always existed in different forms. For example, if you look at uh, the sort of picture historically, so back when the first cellular telephony was invented, 1G you call it, since there was no, by default, no encryption, and uh, so there could be eavesdropping and many attacks, and then as JSM came along, we put in some encryption, but it was very lightweight encryption. So we found all sorts of uh, uh, attacks uh, where even, uh, uh, I think in London, some big politician's phone was hacked by somebody using uh, illegally available, uh, available devices to capture the conversation. So this is... A, and of course, what happened is that the 3GPP and the community moved forward. We made uh, those things much more robust in 3G and 4G. But new threats came on because we ended up with new and more complex uh, protocols. And if you look at 5G today, we have uh, a much more softwareized network. We have uh, NFC, uh, NFC and uh, SDN. 
So here, since network is getting virtualized, the software defined networking is there. People talk about edge computing. All these things create uh, new threats. And as we go towards 6G, which is, of course, still in a definitional phase, there is going to be a far more element of AI and ML at every level of the network. And that will lead to new kinds of attacks. Plus, we are going to go towards open networking and open RAN and things like that, which will create its own problems. So uh, we want, well, uh, we need to address the issues that we are already facing and have existed in 4G and 5G and be careful whenever we construct a network to properly take care of the known attacks in those uh, traditional technologies, but also start worrying about uh, in time uh, the challenges that are going to be faced with 6G. Another important aspect of 6G is that the time frame 6G is going to come in the 2030 time frame is when we are expecting it to be fully standardized and available. And for large scale rollouts, it may be another two, three years from there. And uh, if you look at it, uh, there is so much effort going on and the follow up speaker is going to talk about quantum communication. Also quantum computing is happening in a big way. There is all these efforts which, and if they fructify as expected, we may have, um, pretty powerful quantum computers in that time frame, 2030 to 3035, in which case many of the cryptographic protocols we are currently using, which are often based on hardness of factoring and related problems, may not be usable in those time frames. So we may have to evolve that also. So I'm just highlighting some of the high level points here. Uh, uh, going on to the next slide, uh, so this brings out the same points, but a step expands the picture. You see, in 6G, one of the what is the driver for 6G? When we say we want 6G, so the question becomes, why did we want 5G? And uh, as a user, what is the benefit of 5G? So the point is more softwareization, higher speeds. That's of course enhanced uh, EMBB is always uh, there. Then we wanted ultra reliable, low latency communication which has not yet happened in 5G, but we expect it will happen. And what that will open up is new kinds of applications, right? And then similarly, massive IoT uh, is the third feature of 5G, which has still not widely been adopted. We expect it will start getting adopted in 5G advanced and eventually in 6G. So these will open up enormous new areas, application areas, whether it is industry 5.2, or UAV-based mobility, connected automobile vehicles, smart grid 2.0, collaborative ro robots, hyper-intelligent healthcare. We, you know, we have seen all these claims that one can, using 5G and maybe even 6G, do remote uh, telehealth and even minor surgery remotely, things like that. And then, of course, extended, augmented and extended reality, virtual reality, digital twins, these are the applications we are talking about. And all these applications leverage the fact that they may be edge cloud, right? Edge intelligence and artificial intelligence will be integrated at every level in the network, right? And then often for handling the distributed uh, computing part of things, we say maybe blockchain or distributed level ledger technology may get used. Uh, for some aspects, quantum communication may be used. Uh, terahertz bands are envisaged in 6G. Uh, for the short haul communication, there's a lot of work going on on visual light communication. So what we are talking about is, uh, and then this other thing is that uh, we are talking about 6G as being a tactile network, a network which is sensing oriented. So it's capable of doing distributed sensing and intelligent decision making based on those. And finally, of course, the requirements of 6G demand even lower latency, higher throughputs and higher coverage requirements, higher availability requirements. So any attack, attacker, now you have such a complex network with so many applications. So you could have application level attacks, you could have network level attacks, you could have radio level attacks. You could have attacked the AI component, you could attack the edge component, you could have attacked the cloud component. So all we are saying is that the complexity of the network goes up. And the complexity also means 
more places, more APIs, which are maybe open or accessible and which can be attempted by the uh, adversary to be attacked. So for instance, let me go to the next slide. If you look at the network as a whole, we are saying at the core, we will have uh, basically a cloud-based core on top of which we will have virtual virtualized RAN and virtualized core network. It We may be using an open network. When we say an open network, what do we mean by an open network? So if you if we recall, just just I'm sure most of you are aware because that is something that TSDSI has been working on and the telecom community has been working on a lot. But just to reiterate, in an open network, what we are saying is that it's a multi-vendor network. There may be equipment coming from different vendors and the equipment will work together because of standardized APIs. So you may have a core from somebody, an HLR from somebody, uh, an authentication engine from somebody else, the, uh, the RAN itself may be from somebody else, and it's all supposed to work together. So when you have an open network, you have open APIs, these are standard, standardized APIs, and a vulnerability in one system may lead to an attack to other. So that's why open network, though it's nice, it is uh, more scalable, it is, you don't have vendor lock-in if you have an open network, but from a security perspective, you are saying now different pieces which A, how much they have been tested together and B, the security assumptions in the different pieces may be slightly different. And that may lead to a place where an opening can be found by our attacker. Similarly, the other aspect is that we are talking about software defined network and open source technologies for the 6G core and 6G radio access network. You have this effort that is going on and for 5G already we are having demonstration networks which are working on open RAN and uh, it is envisaged that open RAN may mature a lot more and in 6G may be open RAN based which means that you are now also depending on open source software. So and then as I said there is AI at the local level, there is AI across the RAN, there is AI across the core and there is AI end to end. And each of these AI systems could be attacked potentially. See, AI envisaged, if you look at the current conversation, whether it is building a power supply, people are saying even the sophisticated power supply controller should have AI in it uh, to be do well. For doing adaptive modulation and coding, uh, in the physical layer, people talk about using AI there. And similarly, at every level, all the way to VR, AR, and many applications, AI could get used. And even the decision of how to allocate resources in the network, you may be using AI. Even SDN may depend on AI in the, going forward, the way things are evolving. We don't know. So all of this tells us that there is a lot of potential. There is more complexity and a lot of potential sort of attack surface as we call it. And uh, of course, all of this is supposed to work on a massively connected network. There are a lot of uh, robots and devices, which are low end devices, which may be easy to for some adversity to grab and physically compromise. So that also we, uh, design has to take care of. Right. Uh, going on. Uh, so this is uh, just uh, listing out what I said earlier. So there's the threat from open source software because software is open source. An attacker has an entire copy of the source, open source software. And just to illustrate, the number of vulnerability detected in open source software has rapidly increased over the last 10, 12 years, from 500 a year to 6,000 a year a couple of years ago. So the point is, just because it's open source does not mean there are no vulnerabilities. It just means people are fixing them rapidly, hopefully. Right, they are found quickly and fixed. With. But uh, there are, as you can see, even in key security protocols like uh, OpenSSL, key attacks were found in the recent past, which had existed as a vulnerability for many years and not been noticed. So, an attacker who can look at the software and play with it, do fuzzing attacks on it, analyze it thoroughly, 
can come up with a zero day vulnerability which he does not expose and use that to attack our network so what we are saying is of course closed source software also has vulnerabilities it's not the closed source software doesn't but you don't have the source so you can't really exercise all the control paths a priori because the source code is not with you but in some sense open source is a double edged sword so that's all we are talking about here then we said threats from network ai since we are going to do ai and ai we know that there is this business of making the ai make mistakes what is called adversarial adversarial machine learning this is a very rapidly growing field where people have shown that whether it's a image processing algorithm you can take an image add a small amount of subtle noise to it and suddenly the facial recognition algorithm stops working see because though to the human eye it looks the same but to the machine learning algorithm the added noise messes up its uh, classifiers so same way we an attacker can cause any part of the ai to malfunction by suitable adversarial attacks targeting the particular ai algorithm that is being used so this is the new kind of threat that did not exist and does not exist in 5g today because we are not using ai that extensively now the second part is as we have seen with mobile computing over time it has gotten more and more pervasive and uh, today on your mobile phone so much data about you is already there now we are seeing that with cars and uh, connected cars and things like that even more information is being uh, collected by the peop- collected by the network or the car and then all this information as you go to 6g can give uh, the network or the applications very great deal of very private information about you what is called 5g fine grain privacy invasion can happen and if an attacker gains access to this fine grain privacy data it can be a huge problem so there is uh, this whole aspect of privacy threats right which just the pervasiveness of the sensing leads to a bigger level of threat with 6g than it was with 5g then of course we know that the network has got completely virtualized and softwareized so all the network functions are now being implemented using commodity hardware and certain kinds of hypervisors or containers so you use virtualization and containerization technology but there are bugs in hypervisors hypervisors can be attacked and once a hypervisor gets compromised all the guest operating systems on it the data from that can be exfiltrated so it can become a huge problem i'm not saying this is likely to happen but attacks like this have been found so we have to design to work with that all i'm pointing out to you is it's a far more complex wider threat landscape and in that threat landscape as a network designer or as a security researcher you have to look at many more aspects and there are if you are a researcher maybe more af- opportunities to devise clever algorithms and clever techniques to detect any hypervisor compromise to block it and similarly with any of the other aspects that i have talked about finally as i mentioned since quantum computing is coming Uh, is envisaged to be coming that again is a two edge thought you could use quantum communication technologies for very secure communication end to end for strategic and other applications uh, of course 6g directly will not support it but who knows 6g may as time goes on what happens with 6g standardization uh, and we will hear um, the next keynote which will talk more about quantum com- communication and 6g uh, but the very fact quantum computing is here also means that uh, crypto algorithms will not some of the old ones will not be secured anymore and newer ones which are quantum safe will need to be deployed and some standardization has already happened maybe some more evolution of that standardization is also needed uh this is the sort of uh, i in the interest of time i will not uh, 
go in great detail about it. Uh, how much time do I have? About 10, 5, 10 more minutes? Uh, yeah, you have about six, uh, six minutes, Professor. Okay. Okay, good. Thanks. So uh, this is uh, matrix is trying to just divide all of this. If, uh, what I already said, network openness, open source and all that. And the potential solutions that you could use for each of them. Uh, I will uh, like, for example, to do network openness properly. You need to have security governance systems where all the providers follow some broad security guidelines and that must be standardized. and um and so on and then as far as open source you should have a very thorough vulnerability management system automatic patching and all of those things for virtualization trusted execution environments are well understood you have to make sure they are properly deployed and virtual machine introspection is enabled by default uh, and then for the privacy part of it you need to make sure that you have a proper uh, anonymization and privacy algorithms and uh, data exfiltration is prevented and so on, right? Uh, now, finally, I said that there is the, that was the network level aspect. Finally, we are talking about the applications themselves. And since there, we are talking about far more sophisticated applications. If you look at UAV based mobility, for example, right, this needs extremely low latency, extremely high scalability, zero touch security. If you look at this matrix, the red edge indicates what every application needs. So if you look at UAV mobility, it needs that. It doesn't uh, uh, care about ultra lightweight security. It doesn't care about proactive security so much. Medium is enough, right? Uh, and so on for every application, connected autonomous vehicles, smart grid to and so on. So again, for each of these applications, we have to think through what are the challenges for each one of them, right? And uh, they are very different. And if you look at Smart Grid 2.0, attack on it can be very dangerous. Similarly, with connected autonomous vehicles, attacks on the atomic autonomous vehicles or on a traffic system may lead to huge traffic crashes, leading to death and dism dismemberment. So it is uh, definitely something to be carefully designed for, right? But, and in some sense, all these applications are like that, hyper-intelligent healthcare. Again, it's about uh, people's health. It is about elderly care. It's about so many things. And so what we are seeing is these applications are going to be far more sensitive to people's needs. Today, if you look at most of the crime on the cyber crime, it is related to financial crime. People are stealing your bank account, your money and all that because uh, we have not yet gone to fully connected scenarios, which is being envisaged in the next five to 10 years. When you go to fully connected uh, scenarios, you could decide to uh, kill somebody by just hacking their car and crashing it. Right. So the, just imagine things that we have not even thought of today, but which are likely to the technology will be there. Is already there. If you buy a Tesla car or any of the fancy BYD cars that are there, they are already connected cars. If you hack them and make it blow up or crash, already you can uh, theoretically kill somebody with that. I don't know whether any such event has happened. But I'm just saying that we have to be aware that the real life consequences of these vulnerabilities are getting worse and worse instead of just being financial crime now which is quite prevalent in India. Just uh, look at the statistics from the Cybercrime Bureau. Uh, it is going to be far worse with this. So that's why I think we as cybersecurity researchers have to work hard to make sure that 6G is really far more robust. And we do have time, fortunately. Uh, um, so there is a, you have to look at every layer. There are opportunities to do better, right? And whether it is better radio transmission, better make it not so interceptable, uh, lightweight, low overhead protocols so that it is low energy, the, the cryptographic protocols, I mean, and the security and trust protocols, uh, putting in additional factors of authentication, more sophisticated than just being SMS and OTPs, 
uh, which itself has a lot of issues with it, as we all know. Uh, better uh, tools for uh, seeding the encryption algorithms, uh, how to do the open networking in a very thorough way with bespoke security. Uh, and then how to leverage distributed ledger, ledger and other newer technologies, and of course AI, to offer better uh, ecosystem for application designers. Uh, yeah, we have two minutes to wrap up, Professor. I'm, I'm on the last slide, so. Okay. Uh, so point, I think the big high level point is 6G is coming, but it's, there is a little bit of time, not a lot of time, but a little bit of time. Uh, there are already existing security and privacy challenges in mobile communication systems. Uh, 6G will bring additional, both at the application layer and at the uh, other layers. And we need to design the protocols and the standards to have inherent consideration of security baked into mobile communication standards from the start. Uh, this has historically been weak and that uh, because focus has more, much more been on functionality and applications, but it needs to be designed in. And as I said, we do have some time. And so um, I hope uh, all of you and the community and TSDSI will work together to contribute to a more robust 6G standards. With that, I would like to thank everybody. Uh, if you have any questions, I can be reached at uh, this email ID. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Saran, for the uh, insights and valued valuable presentation giving uh, the aspects that 6G is going to take in. So there have been two uh, broad question that has come from the audience. One question says, uh, the current security attacks has resulted because of uh, probably the configurations weren't um, perfect. And then a uh, number of end devices that got connected to the network was uncontrolled. So, uh, so can you share your thoughts, how and what should be considered when we look at from 6G perspective? Well, uh, the point is valid that, you know, there was um, not in the context of mobile computing, but for example, a few years ago, there was an attack where in Boston, a bunch of video cameras got hacked and they were used as attack vectors to the internet and then brought down a large segment of the internet in the northeast of the United States, right? So that was basically because the default configuration on the cameras when they were installed, if the default password was admin, admin, it was sort of left that way, right? So that point you made about lousy configuration is a valid point. But the challenge is if you're going to have millions of devices, then if you're going to expect manual configuration to work, it will not. So that's where you need zero touch kind of algorithm, zero touch kind of standardization. Whereas when you put a device in it, by default, as it enters the network, it it's uh, it gets sort of uh, brought into the network and controlled by the network and its uh, APIs to the outside world are suitably um, blocked or uh, refined. So we need to, to say lousy configuration is you're saying you're blaming the human who installed the device but the human who will install these devices will typically be a very low end service engineer who comes there and plugs a device in and either we train him so well which is a huge challenge also training millions of people to a very high level of security consciousness or the algorithms and the configuration itself is so automated right and I think the second alternative is better, right? Yeah, sure. I agree with you. The, uh, today we are looking at uh, zero touch provisioning orchestration in a much better way so that the configuration is goes end to end and it takes care with checks and balances and puts the configuration. Um, and also we know that when devices get uh, connected to the system, access controls are also being put in place. So been two other questions quickly, uh, maybe for want of time. One is uh, 
the 6G uh, already 5G helps in smart cities. So 6G will be helping in infrastructure based stuff. So uh, they have asked a comment about cross, cross industry collaboration for 6G. Uh, any comments on that, Professor? Clearly, what you are saying is valid that when we say the application is whether it's UAV or automobile industry, in at many level, even all of these are critical infrastructures. Of course, telecom and power are far more critical. But the point is that if transportation also gets critical, right? If you're going to do advanced things that people are talking about, platooning of vehicles, this, that, in the 2030 time frame. So each industry vertical, there will need to be an industry level standardization effort, right? where then the power sector or the telecom sector for the telecom security itself, the network security of the telecom network itself. And similarly for uh, other applications, I think that's all I can say in the interest of time. Sure. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll take the questions that has come in Q and A when we will uh, help to address them, uh, reaching them back. So thank you, Professor uh, Sharan for interest of time. We move to the next keynote. So uh, the next keynote is by Professor Urbashi Sinha, who leads the Quantum Information and Computing Laboratory at Raman Research Institute at Bangalore. Uh, this, inst this particular lab is the, one of the first labs in India, which manufactures and also establishes the establish and establish the usage of entangled and heralded single photon sources towards various applications in quantum science and technologies. I welcome Professor Urbashi Sinha to share her inputs with respect to how quantum related aspect to help for 6G security. Uh, welcome, Professor. Hello, can you hear me, see me? Yes. I'll, I'll yeah. just share my... So, uh... Yes, so thank you very much uh, for uh, you know inviting me to present in this very interesting uh, conference, and I'm uh, very happy to share with you my thoughts on secure quantum communications. Uh, it leads on very well from the previous talk, where we heard a lot about you know the threats to uh, 5G as well as the potential threats to 6G, and how one of the threats is in the quantum domain. And so the idea of this talk is to actually uh, you know, go through uh, uh, what we would say is a you know potential solution to uh, such a threat. So these would be the points of discussion. I will um, you know begin with uh, discussing a little bit about the importance of ICT networks, uh, threat to current networks. Uh, what is quantum key distribution? Uh, the quantum key distribution as a solution to the threat. How to create a, a feasible quantum network? Uh, then bring in the Indian context. I mean, you know, just to sort of highlight uh, the kind of work that has already been happening uh, in this domain uh, to ensure that you know there, there is no uh, lack of understanding that we are actually ready to uh, you know take on these uh, solutions as a country and uh, talk about a new software development which has happened which will also play an important role in this solution and uh, finally how that fits into this uh, network story Okay, so to begin with the importance of ICT networks. Now, um, I mean, we all know that effective transmission of information between intended parties is necessary in any communication. And so in today's digital age, communication is also electronic. And so computer networks or data networks are chains of nodes linked by communication channels. So the nodes receive, transmit, and perform data exchange between endpoints. And this computer networks, you know, they lead to efficient, cost-effective resource sharing and pooling. So, of course, then comes the point about security, right? So, for exchange of secure information, the networks need to be secure networks. So, networks then need to use secret keys for encryption and decryption, which is the old, uh, you know, field of cryptography. So, it's a very uh, well-known field which people have been using uh, for a long, long time. Then comes the question, you know, when we have been using this for a long time, what is the security that we have in today's communication? So, which brings us to this question as to what is wrong with classical cryptography? So, basically, in classical cryptography, unconditional security is not possible. So, here we have an example, which is of what is called the RSA protocol. And so, this is based on the mathematical complexity of factoring large numbers. 
So we all know that you know multiplication is a much easier problem than factorization. And so the RSC protocol uses this as its basis for the uh, security. So on the right, we have Peter Shore, who came up with what is called the Shore's algorithm. And so this algorithm using quantum gates uh, can actually perform factorization in polynomial time. So as opposed to being a very hard problem, this now becomes an easier problem when we have access to quantum computers. So this is essentially the threat that we now face, this sort of uh, you know, possibility, which is now becoming more and more real as we speak. Right? And so computational resources, they grow very fast. And today's hard problem could be solved tomorrow using brute force attack. So we have to remember that the solution need not always be, I mean, you know, the problem need not be only in quantum computing. Of course, new algorithms can also come for classical computers. Right? Then, of course, there's the realization of quantum computers. So my security or our security should be independent of future advancements in computational power, new algorithms or new technology. That is, it should be future secure. And the current way of keeping things secure is not future secure. Because sometime, you know, few years down the line, one can come up with an algorithm which can break today's security. So if you leave something in the bank, for instance, for your progeny, a uh, few years down the line, the person may not inherit it. So that is the kind of problem we are talking about. So this brings forth the need for a you know, paradigm shift, let's say, in how we keep things secure. And one of the solutions is quantum cryptography, where security is actually based on laws of nature or the laws of physics and not on the mathematical complexity of a problem. Because the mathematical complexity of a problem is something which can be broken with time, either classically or quantumly. So this is a paradigm shift we talk about. And the important part here is actually the key distribution problem which is called quantum key distribution. So essentially changing the way in which the, this key is distributed between the sender and receiver. So instead of using mathematically hard problems as the basis, we change it to laws of nature, which of course, you know, are definitely uh, not going to be broken in the near future. So this is what brings us to quantum communication in which essentially, you know, we are concentrating on quantum key distribution, as was mentioned by the previous speaker. There are other ways in which we can also uh, you know, handle quantum computing threats, which is called post-quantum cryptography. But then one has to remember that post-quantum cryptography, there is nothing quantum about it. So it's actually, again, another set of classical algorithms, which uh, at the moment do not seem breakable using quantum computers. But it has a problem that, you know, it is again based on a certain kind of mathematical hardness. So there is no, uh, you know, sort of uh, theorem which tells you that there is nothing which will come up which won't break it in the future. Whereas here we are talking about uh, something which comes from laws of nature. So uh, this is something which uh, is obviously uh, an important tool towards such a uh, solution to this threat. And so this is what I like to say the most quote unquote practical quantum technology because there is a lot of uh, quantum key distribution that is happening worldwide. Uh, there are many agencies which are already using it to secure their, uh, you know, channels, their networks, and so on and so forth. So this is something which is very much out there and, of course, uh, is in the level of being adopted even in our country. So having said that, how does quantum mechanics, I mean, as a, as a professor who actually does quantum mechanics and who does experiments in quantum mechanics, at least one slide is necessary to tell you which are the principles of quantum mechanics which protect information. So we won't discuss the actual principles because we don't have so much time, but the idea can be summarized as follows. So the basic thing is that measurement disturbs the signal on an average. This is something which uh, is a quantum truth. So as soon as you measure something, you, we say we collapse the wave function. And so that actually leads to you know, uh, being discovered. So if an eavesdropper tries to do something, uh, he or she will then be discovered because the measurement disturbs the signal. So if the signals are non-orthogonal, adversary cannot ascertain which one it is, and that is basically the premise of the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Uh, another principle which we use is that unknown quantum states cannot be cloned by an ad adversary. This is called the no cloning theorem. And this is very handy because, you know, I just can't make a copy and keep it for myself. If I do that, then I will be discovered. And another one which we use is quantum correlations, which are specifically quantum in nature, which is used to protect information. Uh, for instance, quantum entanglement is a very popular quantum correlation used in secure uh, security uh, principles. Okay, so this brings us to the main topic, which is on long distance quantum communications. So of course, you know, when we talk about networks, when we talk about whatever G, right? I mean, you know, 3G, 4G, 5G, then 6G, uh, these are all talking about 
dissemination of information over a long distance, because that is when it actually starts making sense. And so we also need to come up with solutions to such threats to security in networks uh, at a long distance level. Otherwise, it just it, it's, it's just, you know, uh, an exercise which is interesting from an academic point of view. But that is not where we are. So long distance is an important problem. And so this is the idea of long distance, you know, quantum key distribution network, for instance. So we have a quantum key, uh, you know, uh, which is distributed between distant locations using both free space as well as fibers. OK, so free space and fibers together is going to be the solution. And so that then we can connect up various service providers uh, with these keys and they can use it for secure exchange of information. So this is the idea that the entire world is moving towards, which is called the uh, quantum internet. And of course, every lab uh, which works on this problem has its own version of this picture. And so this is ours, where we tell you how we are looking at a future where we have connected up everything using uh, quantum mechanics. Okay. And so this is the you know uh, general idea. So do have a look at these references if you're interested in knowing further details. So this is the you know the key management server, right? So you have, for instance, you know a key management server A, B, C, D. These could be at different sites, right? And so each of them will uh, actually have a QKD node, okay? And so these QKD nodes are then connected up, let's say, by using fiber optic links. That is where we talk about the metro area quantum network. And then beyond metro, we talk about uh, uh, a country-wise uh, backbone. Uh, you know? So these are all ideas which uh, you know, are based on this sort of an approach. And so essentially, you, know, you can have a site you know, just zooming in. You can have various hosts. And then you, know, you can connect them all up using some kind of wavelength division multiplexing. And then you know, uh, one fiber channel, again, another site. So you can multiplex and demultiplex. So this is a fiber-based approach, which will work for shorter distances in general. But then uh, in a metro area, it is possible. Okay. And so this is a little bit further zoomed in version. So you know, this is the base procedure. So the base procedure actually you know, is the QKD link layer. Let's call it QLL. And so essentially, the QKD device generates the keys. Then this quantum network layer stores the local keys. So this is one a level of abstraction. Then we go on to, you know, this supports what is called the core procedure, right? So in the core procedure, what happens is that this key management system inputs the demands, then the, you know, the Q, uh, quantum network layer coordinates the key routing, and then the key management system obtains the keys, okay? And then finally, we have the user service procedure, which again is supported by this core procedure, where we have the host layer, which requests the key, and the key management system issues the key as requested. So as you can see, these this is a bottom-up approach. So the base supports the core. The core supports the user service. And then these guys then in a top-down rely on each other. So the base then becomes the key distribution layer is we, what, what, what we want to replace with the quantum analog. Okay. So now comes the point you know, of long distance. So we talked about fibers. We talked about a little bit about how we can use fibers. But then that is not the end of the story. Because you know, if you want to use just fibers, the problem is that beyond a few hundred kilometers, uh, of course, fibers have losses, which we are very well aware of. So beyond a certain distance, this loss comes in as a problem. Because you cannot have a typical optical amplifier, just like we do in our usual networks because we have no cloning theorem. So we cannot just have a classical repeater solution to this problem. We can't copy and repeat like we do. And so then fibers have their limitation. If you want to do free space communication based on line of sight, that also has its limitation because uh, the Earth is not uh, you know, flat. It is oblate, or you know, let's say it's, it's roundish. So beyond the point, the horizon comes in as a problem. So you can't see. And so there are these you know, limitations to ground-based approaches. And that is where we have solutions coming in from out of the box thinking. And these are the three particular solutions which people are working on. One is called a trusted repeater approach, which is this backbone network. Then we have the quantum memory and quantum repeater approach. And finally, we have satellites uh, as a trusted node. Okay? And so what is happening is the satellite is actually moving in its orbit. right? And so it spends some time on top of one ground station. It exchanges a key. Then it, in its pass, comes across another ground station, exchanges a key. And then by doing certain operations, you're able to connect up two ground stations, which in principle can be located thousands of kilometers apart. So essentially, a satellite can do this really long distance communication you know, in the free space domain. And then after this key is distributed, this can be further distributed to various you know, 
um, you know, host uh, centers by using fiber networks. So that is the general idea. So coming uh, to the Indian context here, you know, we have had the announcement and the launch of the National Quantum Mission in April this year. And as you can see, these are the three, uh, these are the main deliverables of the quantum communications vertical of the National Quantum Mission. As, we, as you know, we have four verticals. So this is the first one here. Uh, is of course the quantum computing. So these are the three for communication, satellite-based secure quantum communications between ground stations over a range of 2000 kilometers within India, long distance secure quantum communications with other countries, and then intercity quantum key distribution, uh, again, over a certain few thousand kilometer range. So this is what we are looking at even as a mission mode problem. And so uh, what I want to spend the next few minutes in telling you is, you know, I mean, why particularly I'm giving this talk because, you know, I've been working on this for a long, long time. And so we already have developed capabilities and capacities which make us pretty ready to face these challenges of the uh, national quantum mission. Okay, which brings me to our lab. So I'm uh, heading the quantum information and computing lab where we work a lot on quantum communications. So quantum key distribution, quantum teleportation, quantum relay, repeater technologies, device independent randomness generation, as well as photonic chip based quantum communications. We also work on quantum computing using photons as a hardware problem and cloud based quantum computing as well and, and working towards sustainable development goals of the United Nations in collaboration with CERN. We have quantum sensing going on as well using our entangled photons. And finally, a lot on precision and foundational tests of quantum mechanics, where we keep on improving on various ideas so that we can use them for the technologies which are of interest to us and beyond, right? And so if you are interested more in knowing about quantum communications, then these are some you know, uh, resources which you can have a look at. And of course, we are also now collaborating with the Indian Navy to sort of come up with uh, quantum security for the Indian Navy as a part of the defense uh, problem. Okay, so one of the problems we are working on is, of course, satellite based quantum communications. And this is a collaboration between us and the Indian Space Research Organization. And our project is called Quantum Experiments Using Satellite Technology. And we wish to establish information theoretically secure quantum communication over large distances uh, between two Indian ground stations using an Indian satellite as a trusted node. Okay, so this started uh, end of 2017, beginning of 2018, and we have been at it for a mo little more than five years and achieved several ground-based milestones, which make us now pretty ready uh, to go to the satellite phase, okay? And so for instance, we have done several in-lab protocols, which is very necessary before you go on to a satellite-based approach, you have to do many things in a bottom-up manner, right? And so we have done India's first free, free space QKD experiment. And of course, with very competitive uh, numbers from this, which were better than the previous record from uh, NASA, okay? Then we went on to increase the complexity of the problem. So you can't do this within the lab and be contented with it, right? So you have to do this with a satellite in the end. So we have actually done quantum communication between two buildings in our institute through the atmospheric free space channel, again, for the first time, using entanglement as a resource. Uh, earlier this year, we actually created our moving Bob. You can see Alice and Bob are our uh, communicators. So this is our moving Bob. So this is actually something which has all the you know, optics, optomechanics, synchronization, electronics, and pointing acquisition tracking that is needed, uh, which we want to now miniaturize and optimize, uh, which then we can fly in a satellite. Okay. So this is our, you know, first version of a payload for a quantum satellite, where we have been able to move the receiver and continue doing quantum communication with it using entanglement as a resource. Uh, these are, you know, some very interesting developments which we have in the software domain, which could be particularly interesting for the current uh, discussion. So I will talk about it for a couple of minutes next. Um, and then, you know, several things which you need to do in order to actually do satellite QKD. It's not just a simple matter of, you know, just doing QKD and then talking to a satellite. So you have to deal with atmospheric problems. You have to realize where exactly to set up these ground stations. So we've done thorough analysis of that as well, you know, uh, to know which would be the likely locations where we can have good key rate and lower Cuba, and then come up with new techniques to mitigate the various problems that atmosphere poses, including scrambling of polarization and so on. So as I mentioned a couple of minutes on this new development, which is a software that we have developed, which we call QKD SIM. Now, uh, there are several, you know, competing uh, toolkits in literature. So these are some of the ones which you will find. And these, some of them also deal with network 
uh, simulations. Okay, but the problem is that QKD is becoming commercially viable. It is already commercially viable, and so several engineering techniques are being proposed, and several protocols are coming up. So you can't just you know have the resources to set up the protocol and then figure out whether it needs an improvement. You need a pre-evaluation stage, which is uh, you know less uh, expensive, and software then comes in handy. And so most of what we currently have uh, misses quick and precise simulation of physical processes as well as you know uh, experimental non-idealities. And so that is the gap which we have filled actually, where uh, you know we are uh, essentially dealing with uh, software where we take into account physical process models and realistic imperfection and experimental non-idealities and tested its prototype performance with our own uh, you know experimental demonstrations and they have had beautiful match. And so we are following the Agifall model of software development, which I'm sure you're aware of, uh, which bring, brings in, you know, the agility, because we have so many different modules in this, that if tomorrow someone comes up with a better module, let's say for the detection, I can replace mine with his, and, and the rest of it remains sacrosanct. So this is how we have developed this software. And so these are our, you know, uh, actual Addison Bob modules. But this is what is very important. As you can see, the experiment and simulation have a very nice match both uh, you know in day and night and this is important because if you just use commercially available software they don't take into account the fact that quantum key distribution is actually an experiment and so these non-idealities go missing so what you you know sort of end up simulating is way better than what you end up actually uh, doing in a in an actual experiment and so this is how our key rate and cube uh, you know were compared with the previous result and so this was from nasa as i mentioned and so we got a lot of attention from the public domain uh, you know the industry as well as uh, the government of india okay and so how does qkd sim fit into this quantum network story you know basically a network architecture that we are talking about here how does this fit in so it actually simulates qkd protocols as i mentioned considering physical process models realistic imperfections and experimental non idealities and demonstrates very good match with experiment so many simulators exist for traditional networks, and there are now quite a few for quantum networks as well. But these simulators generally focus on the rest of the network structure, keeping the QKD layer simple. And so QKD simulators simulate QKD, but not with these experimental and process-related imperfections that affect a real QKD implementation. So our idea is that our software will find its place in the quantum network simulation by making the QKD layer more real and less ideal, which obviously overall is going to be a better you know, indicator of what kind of security we are gaining by replacing the key layer with quantum key distribution in the overall network story. So having said that, you know, last minute, I just wanted to acknowledge that, you know, we have been doing this relentlessly for a long time, and we have had a fair share of appreciation in the public domain for all our efforts, you know, as a lab in quantum communications and beyond. And so this was for our, you know, results, as I just showed you. And then this is something I have to highlight because the government of India recognizing you is always non-trivial. And so this was for our, you know, QKD SIM software as well as experiment, okay. And in communications between buildings, also we were much, uh, you know, uh, appreciated. And very, uh, you know, the early this year, this was uh, how we created our moving Bob. Uh, and so now we are ready to actually do a launch in a satellite with support from ISRO over the next few years with the National Quantum uh, Mission. Okay, and quantum computing as well is something we are very, uh, we are working on. I, I don't want to talk about it a lot, but uh, just to give you a flavor. So I think I'm. Um, on time and so i want to thank you for your attention and i hope you know you gained a little perspective on quantum communications and how it can be a solution to the threats to xg thank you uh, uh, am i still you. with you okay yes uh, yes yes uh, thank you thank you professor uh, thank you for that uh, certainly insightful uh, presentation where it could help us to understand uh, the evolution and the current state and how in India um, we have uh, grown so much and contributing to quantum and uh, in the satellite networks as well. So from the audience, there are three questions and uh, if you could, uh, we'll try to uh, uh, take it as soon as we can. First question asked by the audience is uh, solution for, D for distributed uh, denial of service and distributed denial of service attacks in uh, QKD. 
So is there some solution for DOS yes. and DDoS attacks? So, so essentially yes. what happens is QKD is actually, uh, you know, based on this sort of, a, uh, you know, principle that we say that, okay, if there is some eavesdropping that we have understood because of, you know, because QKD is based on uh, this idea that an eavesdropper will be detected if our uh, quantum bit error rate increases uh, above the information theoretic security. So now we know exactly what it is for the particular protocol. And so if we see that, okay, there is more error here than what we can allow, then we are going to actually uh, not do the service at all. So we are going to abandon that key distribution altogether. So once we actually do the key distribution, however, then it can be used for secure uh, information exchange later. But then it is at the key distribution level itself that we do not you know, allow it if we find that it is above this information. So the information theory is what comes in very handy because that gives us the threshold. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Second question here is uh, authentication uh, playing an important role in security. So how this will be done using quantum technology? Yes, authentication is actually the first step. And so that is what I didn't uh, talk about a lot. So first thing we do is we ensure that uh, we are actually, Alice and Bob are actually talking to each other. And so there we actually use uh, some kind of a shared uh, randomness. So there is a seed randomness that we share between Alice and Bob. So this can be through entanglement or this can be through, uh, you know, non-entanglement. That is a detail. But then Alice and Bob actually have an authenticated channel to begin with, only then we start with the uh, QKD protocol. So definitely that is necessary. And in fact, um, you know, people say that if that is needed, so there is always a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. So how do you create that? But then we do need some seed randomness to begin with. And that is where, you know, this device independent random number generator could be handy because uh, there even that can increase in some sense the, uh, you know, level of authentication, uh, putting it a little more simplistically than what it is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor. That randomness helps to, uh, mm -hmm. and that secure channel helps to bring in the authentication. The last question from the audience is a comment between PQ, um, post-quantum uh, cryptography and the uh, quantum key distribution. Mm -hmm. So the comment here is um, the US prefers PQC, PQC rather than QKD. Do you have any comment for that? Why PQC is being looked at? Yes, so this is from uh, uh, Dr. Ramaraju. So yes, uh, so the point is that, you know, this is a this is something which we have been dealing with now for a few months, what the US prefers, what Europe prefers. And actually, to be honest, uh, the US has, uh, you know, I mean, I was in a conference last week where I met the person from US who's actually working on quantum key distribution. So, you know, they do have uh, efforts in QKD as well, and they are doing drone-based QKD and so on and so forth. So we were in the same conference. We had a nice chat. So there is a, you know, uh, Europe, on the other hand, is, of course, uh, spending a lot of resources on QKD. So uh, there could be a little bit of a geopolitical angle as to why the US is sticking in the PQC route rather than QKD, because some countries have done exceptionally well in QKD, and there is some... A geopolitics there but then in our scenario i mean you know the i already said this during my talk that pqc is also based on a mathematical problem as opposed to qkd which is based on you know quantum mechanics so laws of nature and laws of quantum mechanics do have a certain role and then of course mathematics so only thing you can say is okay the quantum computer is not going to be able to break pqc as of now we don't have an algorithm yet but there is no theorem, uh, Dr. Ramaraju, that the, uh, this will not come up in the future. So as we are starting a national quantum strategy now, you know, as a nation, India is starting this, it is important and prudent for us to actually invest in both of them so that we, uh, you know, can take a mature call a little bit later down the line, which one we want to adopt. So I don't think we are in a situation that we can just take one and not the other. Whereas there is definitely a little bit of a bias towards one in the US and a bias towards the opposite one in Europe uh, and Canada and so on and so forth. So uh, I don't think it is all scientific, but then it is not also true that they are not doing QKD because I just uh, had a nice chat with the people leading the QKD efforts in US, which are not as much talked about. Uh, thank you, Professor, on want of time. Uh, now I, I hand over the uh, session to Dr. Subbu. 
for the start of the panel discussion. Uh, over Hi, to you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Mani, and uh, it was an excellent session. Uh, thank the uh, keynote speakers, uh, Professor Huzur Saran, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Ubi Sisina. Wonderful, bringing in two different dimensions uh, for this key topic. Uh, good evening, all. So uh, we'll get started with this panel discussion in the same topic. Uh, it is pretty interesting to see that we had two uh, keynote uh, talks tabling uh, different dimensions. One is from the end-to-end -end security, straightly from the migration path from the 5G to 6G, looking at the intricacies from the physical layer to the uh, core, from the radio to the core, as well as to the application, and the evolving uh, context of attack surface, which is kind of keeping on changing. When we add the uh, open network architecture, cloud, VRAN, the evolving scenario of AI and uh, adversarial attack that is uh, tabled, the need for uh, fine-grained uh, privacy invasion, these are set of things that we could carry from the gather from the first set of the key note, which is very important for this panel as well when we move further. And the next talk on the keynote also table uh, approach totally from a different dimension to see how we can leverage the evolving quantum communication paradigm for uh, looking at it and how do we see the convergence of these two happening. Now at this panel, uh, 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 we are thankful and uh, very uh, eager to listen to eminent speakers. So let me, uh, the panel, what we do is like, we will first introduce the speakers and uh, we'll be inviting uh, each one of them and we would uh, request them to uh, share their uh, uh, initial uh, thoughts and uh, a brief. Then we'll go about uh, the Q&A kind of a thing. This is how we'll uh, go about this panel. So we have the uh, panelists here. Uh, very glad to introduce Mr. Ola Renard. He's a distinguished member of the Nokia technical staff and holds the title Principal System Architect at Nokia. He has 27 years of experience in the telecom industry as an architect and technologist, defending career grade rank architecture evolution in support of the digital transformation. Uh, welcome, uh, uh, Mr. Ola. And uh, very glad to introduce uh, Sri G. Narendranath, an officer of the Indian Telecommunication Service, is working as Joint Secretary in the National Security Council Secretariat with responsibilities for coordination in matters of cybersecurity activities by different entities in India in the government, public and private sectors. Welcome, uh, Sri Narendra Ji. We'll move to the uh, next panelist, uh, welcoming Mr. Uh, Prem Lakshman Das, who has completed his PhD in mathematics from Indian Statistical Institute. He works in the domain of algorithmic aspects of algebra and uh, number theory. Welcome, Dr. Prem. And we have uh, uh, Dr. Hemant. Welcome, Dr. Hemant, uh, who is a senior member of IEEE, holds MTech and PhD from IIT Bombay and BE from BSS UT Purla, Odisha. He has more than 25 years of experience in academics, research, and industry. Welcome, Dr. Uh, Hemant. And we have uh, uh, with us uh, Mr. Nagendra Baikampadi. Welcome, uh, Dr. Nagendra, who is heading the uh, security at Rakuten Symphony. He is also currently serving as the vendor, co-chair of the ORAN Alliance uh, Security Working Group, WG11. So we can see that we have an interesting uh, set of uh, uh, panelists from varied uh, uh, domains pertaining to the uh, 6D ecosystem. And it's going to be pretty interesting to listen to them and their uh, insights on how uh, the uh, 5G++ uh, scenario is getting sh uh, shaped up and what are the concerns and uh, what are the approaches one can think of from multiple dimensions. Uh, so to start with, may I now request uh, Mr. Ola to uh, share his initial thoughts, maybe for about five to seven minutes, and then uh, we'll uh, invite the other speakers. Over to Mr. Ola. Yeah, thank you. I uh, hope, you, hope you can hear me now. <clears throat> um, yes, yes, absolutely. Thanks. I think most of what was I was intending to say already has, has been said, so thank you very, very, very much for the key speakers. I might maybe add the a view of a vendor. 
as a member of Nokia. Uh, in Nokia, we think that uh, sec security, privacy, and trust in mobile network is one of the six key drivers for 6G. Uh, you know, uh, we have we have seen it in the in the past that um, uh, the uh, uh, mobile uh, networking industry has been a hopefully valuable business for vendors and op op operators, but it becomes more and more an integral part of society. So threats on se on security on our mobile and also the other networks is less and less just a threat for for the upper, the operators, so, but a central threat to uh, our, our very societies. And that's why uh, well, we think that uh, security is less and less an option. It is more and more a, a, a necessity. Now, from a vendor, vendor point of view, what we would uh, think the industry needs is, of course, the uh, support of, uh, uh, yeah, some, uh, uh, means uh, for security to uh, keep pace with the involving net networking features that mainly mainly needs hardware hardware support of current and future algorithms, which we also need to need, need to standardize, and then also an uh, uh, enhanced trust network. As current trust networks are either non-existing non or, or centralized, uh, which would not help with all the other key drivers, the other, the other, the other five, uh, one of them being uh, scale and flexibility. So we need scalable and flexible trust networks, which might uh, uh, require uh, a less uh, centralized approach as PKIs are, are, are today, but a more, a more distributed approach like a uh, ledger or something or, or some similar, similar technology. So that's just my initial thoughts. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, may I now request uh, uh, Sri G. Narendra Ji to uh, share his initial thoughts. Yeah, thank you. I think I uh, really like the initial comment that uh, Mr. Ola has made that whatever he wanted to say, the others have said in the keynote. <laughs> that was really <laughs> interesting <laughs> and you know it's spot on yeah having said that you know, as uh, and he has made some uh, very relevant points you know saying that the security privacy and trust are some key aspects that they consider and then it's a necessity and then uh, one of the things he mentioned is about keeping pace because of the developments that are happening and uh, scalable, flexible, but trusted networks. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, we already have security challenges. It's not that we don't have security challenges. And have those security challenges been addressed uh, in the current uh, networks or the current deployments and uh, current way of operations of the networks? Uh, not yet. Uh, it's not that uh, we don't have solutions for them. There are many solutions that are there. So there are some operational issues which are there, some issues with capacity and capability that exist in the current uh, uh, way the people are deployed and the way the networks are deployed. So those uh, there is, those challenges are there and those challenges have to be addressed and they will continue to be there when you talk of 6G also. So what are they? See, one is, you know, uh, we've been talking, and I, this is the one thing I've talked in multiple forums, is secure by design is something that we talk about. And whenever they, and uh, whenever the people take pieces of technology and then start deploying, or designing so solutions, their own solutions using those technologies, the secure by design is something that we talk about so that the deployments are secure. But not many people really adopt the secure by design principles. So that is one important concept that secure by design has to be adopted. How do we get it? How do we get that done is an important thing, especially with, uh, you know, with the 6G coming in, we, even with the open networks. And one of the things that Mr. Huzun Saran, uh, Professor Huzun Saran talked about was about openness and having multiple pieces coming from different vendors. How do you ensure secure? Now we have one vendor. We could actually 
you know, evaluate that wonder and see that how robust processes they have for the security. And then say that, okay, they have inbuilt in-house, very secure process for development of uh, products and services. And that's why we are assured of some, some trust element is there. But when you have different pieces coming from different uh, vendors, how do you ensure the security across each of these vendors? That's a challenge. And that challenge has to be addressed, especially when 6G is coming along and when you have multiple vendors who are going to come into, into place. So here we have a challenge and that is one that is required to be addressed. So one way, I don't know, do I give my initial comments or complete my whole, all my thoughts in the initial go? You can, you can go ahead, sir. You can go ahead. Okay. Okay. So one of the things that I feel, you know, that would be required here is to definition of processes, uh, how exactly, you know, product and uh, services de development happens. Uh, that's a standardization activity that people should take part in. So that then we say that evaluate in any organization based on whether those practices are being followed in the organization for development of those products and services, the evaluation and certification processes for that. So that will be important for, especially for the multi-vendor system and to establish a trusted vendor for supplying of all of those things. That is one part. The other is we, you know, we talk about uh, these hyper-connected, uh, uh, you know, when you talk of 6G, yes, with 5G itself, you're talking of fiber connectivity, but with 6G, you're going to come to a very high scale of fiber connectivity you're going to talk about. And then we already talk of cyber physical systems. And then it, it, it will also be because of the type of uh, sensors that we are talking about and the uh, ubiquitousness of the sensors that were deployed. It will be a lot more intrusive in terms of where the sensors would get deployed. Maybe a lot of sensors would get deployed into human bodies itself to find out, you know, in each part of the organ, how that organ is functioning to have, uh, you know, maybe delivery of, you know, for uh, diagnostics purposes, maybe, or for delivery of drugs and for monitoring the functioning of the body, uh, you know, treatments and all of that. So it would be very highly in intrusive. And this is where the uh, concepts, the problems, challenges of the privacy, the data that gets generated, how do you protect the data, all of those challenges would come in. And these, of course, then we'll, uh, we'll have to actually study, especially regarding the devices and the sensors. How do you protect those devices and sensors from being breached? Uh, how do you have the security of that? And IoT security is one thing that we're already talking about. And that has that, sec has that been addressed now? Even now, you know, we talk of, you know, recently you have the HC1 about consumer IoT, 303645, I think that's come about. Uh, consumer IoT, but there's no mandate or anything for uh, you know having coming up with security requirements for the IoT devices, and then say that if somebody wants to get a secure IoT device, there's no way you can go and purchase a secure IoT device. There's no current mechanism for that. So you know, so this is another challenge that I see uh, coming up with with the multi proliferation of all these devices and sensors. How do you classify all of them? How do you categorize them? How do you come up with the security requirements? All of that. How do you mandate that only secure devices are used? What are the regulatory and uh, legislative mechanisms uh, that will be required to see that only secure devices are put in? What are the liabilities that will uh, incur if somebody uses non-secure devices and that is a cause for some security breach or that is used as a vector for uh, you know breaching somebody else? So this is another area I think uh, that I feel with 6G, these things requires to be honest. The other is because of the multifarious devices, multifarious software that are uh, utilized, and a lot of edge compute that happens, a lot of orchestration that will happen. And at that level, the how do you secure the orchestration layer? Because you can have catastrophic consequences with you know compromises of the orchestration layer. And that is where I think uh, is another area uh, that uh, you know we'll have to look at. Uh, then the other is there's a lot of learning that you know we have to get from current to what's happening. From, our, from the NSCS, when we look at it, we get lots of reports of, you know, vulnerabilities in systems across the country, breaches that are occurring, occurring breaches of the country. And then when we do a study of all of those, we find that many of these things are some things that they can be addressed. It's the same thing getting repeated across organizations, the same thing getting repeated within an organization. So these are challenges, you know. So this is where I'm talking about the capacity capability and especially with uh, 60 coming along and the technology is getting... Uh, proliferated across wide varieties of the society, wide variety of organizations, per se, might not be having the technical competence to handle the technology. You know, and that's where the challenge becomes bigger, that how do you help have these, you know, organizational structures in place to see that, you know, the, these technological challenges are addressed 
at each of those points where this technology and the 60s is making an impact so i think the these uh, these are some of the things that i talked about of course there was one mention about ai digital ledger technologies and free space optics and all i think next one when i when you give me another 5 minutes i'll talk about that thank you thank you thank you so much uh, for uh, covering the gamut of uh, issues that are there that uh, needs to be addressed thank you sir for that and we uh, now request dr prem lakshman das to uh, share his thoughts on how he perceives the post quantum cryptography which was again uh, tabled in the first keynote as well yeah over to you dr prem yeah meaning to begin with i completely agree with uh, professor sinhas who sh- she said that uh, meaning uh, we should look at both qkd as well as pqc uh, meaning from our, our national perspective uh, meaning i uh, meaning i just want to recall that um, you use encryption for providing confidentiality and uh, uh, mac in the symmetric key setting for providing authentication and digital signatures in the public key setting for providing authentication again so uh, when you talk about mac so it is assumed that uh, the two parties essentially have the same key so that they can authenticate use, using that key it, it is called the message authentication code uh, but uh, that is somewhat a unreasonable assumption in kind, in uh, meaning in a in a open kind of a network so uh, what people talk about is this uh, signatures and uh, like what uh, professor sinha, sinha was saying uh, the current uh, meaning solutions which use say rsa which is based on factoring or diffie hellman based uh, things they become uh, meaning completely broken polytime with the advent of a quantum computer sure sir gautam like she what she was saying so uh, meaning qkd solves the solution uh, the problem of uh, meaning uh, the key agreement problem so that the two peers can get a common key and uh, i completely agree with her when she when she says that qkd is the way to go when you talk about uh, meaning certain components of uh, meaning key sharing between peers in a network but uh, meaning there is also this pqc which uh, is there lurking in the meaning somewhat in the background uh, where we say that we don't use per se any quantum principles but we design our math in such a way that uh, it is not breakable as of now like uh, as of today using a quantum computer so that is where this pqc comes into the play so uh, meaning uh, there, there are two main things uh, when which we talk about here again which is namely confidentiality and authentication so confidentiality uh, meaning there is something called the kem key encapsulation mechanism which is a public key primitive uh, which has a post quantum analog also which is studied uh, in the community so the other thing is authentication which you get um, using a digital signature like i said so uh, that you can design it in such a way that it is also not breakable by a quantum computer so there are post quantum analogs of uh, this key encapsulation mechanism as well as this uh, digital signatures uh which is uh, meaning being currently studied by the community and there is a huge uh, um, uh, program which is being run by nist currently uh, to kind of standardized uh, to kind of standardize uh, what will be the post quantum replacements for the current day rsa or diffie hellman based crypto systems so uh, we all know that uh, currently there is this for example kyber which is a, a key encapsulation mechanism which has been standardized by the nest and dilithium which is a signature which is being standardized by the nist so this together as a suit uh, meaning uh, th- there are uh, standards being written around them called the fips fips standard and uh, they will become somewhat uh, the I mean, the back backbone of kind of standardizing uh, how these get actually uh, embedded into various uh, protocols like this tls for example and various other things now coming to the 6g context uh we see that uh, meaning uh, in uh, the previous uh, versions of this uh, gs a uh, lot of mac has been used and lot of encryption using symmetric key ciphers like block ciphers and stream ciphers have been used and they are largely not affected by this quantum computer because there is no structure and uh, the best you can do is brute forcing using also quantum so the main uh, meaning problem there is q, uh, the key, key encapsulation key agreement which is partly solved by this uh, Uh, QKD, or you can do a classical KEM for achieving the same kind of a functionality. So the other thing is signature, and uh, we see that uh, there is an authenticated key agreement protocol, which is a uh, backbone of this uh, public key infrastructure, which is used by 5G uh, network, for example. And it is as as far as I see, it is I believe that it will continue to be used in 6G, 
with the meaning with so many iot devices getting connected to 6g so this kind of a pki network will be relevant even in the context of 6g so that being said making it post quantum secure i think uh, that is what the uh, meaning the 6g security standards people are talking about and in the context of this nist competition whatever gets standardized by this nist competition they get in some sense uh, meaning absorbed by the 6g security uh, community st standards and i think they will com com continue to play a kind of this uh, role with, with the classical crypto uh, graphy has been playing but with the additional kind of a advantage that it will be uh, resilient to quantum attacks so i think that uh, meaning there is this uh, plan for migration and uh, the functionality of confidentiality integrity and authentication being provided by signatures and cams and migration to post quantum using dilithium and kyber and hence writing flip standards then writing a tls standard and adopting that to 6g i think that is the kind of chain of ideas which i just want to uh, kind of put forward thank you sir thank you dr prem excellent i think uh, you brought in the perspective of how the uh, uh, post quantum crypto primitives can get embedded in the evolving 6g context uh, largely using the uh, chem for the authentication and uh, uh, digital signature schemes as a suit for the pk thank you uh, now uh, may I request Dr. Uh, Heyman to pitch in and uh, share his views on uh, how he perceives the uh, evolving uh, uh, 6G security context. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening, all. Uh, uh, pick, uh, let me start uh, with the application perspective. I was thinking of uh, talking from the application perspective. 6G, like as you said, uh, like many people have said, like it will be a very strict and very tight uh, key performance indicators uh, in terms of delay, in terms of throughput, in terms of bandwidth will be there. Now, when you talk about uh, new technologies which are going to provide support to these kind of uh, key performance indicators, okay. We need to have various technology like say quantum computing systems, we can have AI driven devices, we can have intelligent radio, we can have molecular communication also, we can have uh, the smart surfaces, so many new technologies are going to evolve and going to be deployed. Uh, on the top of that, all these new applications which we are going to see in the uh, beyond 2030 or something like that will be also deployed. Now, the, coming from the applications, along with the new uh, existing applications, we will have various new applications which are going to play a major role uh, in 6G, uh, which uh, from the user perspective, you ask me. So some of the applications like, say, uav based uh, monitoring, uh, it will be very, very real-time monitoring kind of thing where we will have uh, URLLC or uh, all kind of communications will be there, which uh, still uh, is, is not uh, been realized in 5G, but it has to be realized in uh, 60 uh, kind of things. Now we'll have connected automobile vehicles uh, kind of applications also will be there where uh, we'll have all kind of uh, like vehicle to vehicle kind of communications, vehicle to uh, other kind of communications will be there. And that has to be very, very real time kind of things from the application perspective. Then we'll be have smart grid 2.0. We'll have uh, something like say industry 5.0 kind of things. We'll have uh, all kind of say digital twins uh, then uh, we'll have all kind of uh, mixed uh, reality or extended reality kind of things will be there. We'll have collaborative robots. So many other things will be uh, will be there from the application perspective. From various applications will be there. Now these applications, when you talk about these applications, these applications will have different uh, security requirements. These applications, when you uh, when you deploy actually in the field, they will have different different uh, security requirements. Now, the some of the security like say challenges from the application perspective will be like say access control. First thing will be access control. Now, how are you going to do a lot of access control? Because and see a lot of applications uh, tomorrow or uh, in during 60 kind of things so we're going to deploy it will be a software like they will have open software kind of things, open source kind of solutions. When you go for open source kind of solutions, then software vulnerability will be a major impact from the security perspective. Then we'll have uh, because these applications, uh, are, along with this, uh, whatever uh, AI will be deployed, uh, we, we need to have all kind of distributed systems. Because when you go for uh, very low latency kind of communications, low for the applications, you need to have distributed AI kind of things. When you go for distributed AI kind of things, you need to have a distributed control mechanism deployment. 
when you distributed control mechanism then the controller issues will be there because there itself will have all kind of authentication mechanism will have all kind of uh, data accessibility data storage all kind of things will be there because th there itself all my communications issues will come then we will have uh, other other aspects will be like poisonous attacks will be there. We'll have jamming, we'll have modification attacks, we'll have uh, some other things. Then there can be a possibility of physical attacks also will be there. So these 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 things will be very, very essential from the application perspective. This come if you ask me from the application perspective. Now, if you have to model these threats, uh, if I have to counter these threats, you have to model the threats, how I have to handle it, I have to ha I have to start modeling the threats for each application in a separate manner. Because, or or, if, or you can go for a very vertical, you uh, some kind of business, uh, verticals kind of thing, or use case specific, or you can combine multiple applications and say, okay, for these applications, these are the threat model, you have to model it and try it out. Because each applications can have different kind of requirements. Like, for example, if I go for, say, robotic surgery kind of applications from the healthcare perspective. Now, if I go for there itself, there are two kinds of data. There will be signaling data. There will be huge amount of uh, actual uh, real-time touch data or uh, tactile data has to be involved. So I have to understand what data is getting involved, how the data is getting connect, uh, uh, collected, how the data is being accessed, because that is getting going through open system open network right so we need to understand that kind of things so there we need to have uh, like uh, confidentiality we need to have integrity of the data integrity of the network integrity of the devices also very important the authentications availability and access control all these things are going to be very very essential very very important uh, from that perspective now if we if I go for this application specifically say if i go for applications like uh, in flight uh, services or if i go for uh, some kind of say bullet uh, some kind of internet in bullet train kind of things so there itself will have a high speed mobility uh, and then there itself we have to bring security that then we have to have certain kind of handover authentications for those kind of things we need to when you bring authentications we have to have handover authentications to handle this kind of things real time communications kind of things then you need to have different uh, mutual authentications you will have physical layer authentications you will have reliable authentications those things also will be essential from the applications perspective uh, from the uh, from the security perspective now as uh, navendra sir was, sir was telling if i have to handle those things if i have to handle uh, the security challenges and uh, go for certain kind of solutions first thing is like i have to think security as a, like the usually people think security as an uh, some kind of add on things you do everything then security as a new things so you should not do that way as he said like you have to part think as a part of design systems you have to start security is essential factor start from that perspective then there itself you can bring the new architecture like so you can have zero trust kind of security architecture you can have new completely different kind of architecture for actual deployment whether uh, your physical network can be different physical network can be CLT based or some kind of intelligent radio or you can have quantum computing but your architecture has to be different so that applications can be deployed in a better way then you have to bring based on the kind of architecture you have to bring what kind of authentications mechanism we are going to bring what kind of cryptographic mechanism we are going to bring for these kind of things because some applications say if we go for iot kind of applications there the devices will be very zero energy kind of devices there i cannot have very uh, like uh, heavy graphic uh, <coughs> mechanism i need to have some kind of lightweight distributed mechanism has to we have to deploy so we need to understand from that perspective so we have to bring also intrusion detection systems we have to bring uh, new technologies like say if you can bring blockchain uh, uh, to the uh, a specific thing and uh, try to see if you can have uh, whatever data communication you are going to do between devices between the device and the <coughs> application server all that if you, if you can see those kind of things are also getting uh, actually stored in a proper way actually getting accessed in a proper way those things will be also very very essential for that perspective uh, i'd like to uh, like maybe uh, <coughs> stop maybe the next you. start and discuss it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hemant. I think you uh, nicely uh, highlighted the, the crux of some of the aspects when you talk about security to balance between the application specific demands 
highlighting on the you know the performance aspect that may come from high speed uh, uh, mobility or from uh, you know energy consumption perspective so these are pretty important uh, points that what you kind of uh, table now let us uh, welcome our uh, uh, esteemed panelist uh, mr nagendra uh, to kindly share his views uh, thank you dr subhu uh, thanks for having me it's my pleasure to be part of this uh, esteemed group of uh, security experts uh, as professor huzur uh, uh, laid out at the very beginning 60 is still in definition phase so uh, really there is only so much we can do in terms of uh, you know proper security analysis um, uh, having said that um, it's uh, you know if, if you look at the um, uh, the the kind of um, the the broad consensus that we have uh, on what kind of applications will be part of 6g uh the kind of technology enablers that we think will be part of the 6g uh, network uh he also talked about certain security requirements which are sort of like you know still in initial initial discussions and i've also seen some proposals on how the existing 5g network you know uh, might evolve uh, to support 6g services but for all these concepts to be standardized and uh, you know for the vendors to actually implement them it will take many many more years after all we are talking about 60 deployment beginning in 2030 so I, i think it's expected that standardization probably won't kick off until um, end of 25 or even maybe 2026 uh, so proper security analysis of the 60 network can only happen once those are available uh, however i'd like to point out a couple of challenges i mean there are a, there are a whole lot of challenges that uh, you know all our esteemed panelists talked about Uh, but i like to highlight two challenges which have not been uh, uh, addressed so far uh, if, if i just look at the plethora of applications um, and devices that are expected to connect to the, the new 6g network uh, i think it is fair to say that uh, the number of threat actors that we are going to see uh, is bound to increase exponentially uh, right uh, we are after all talking about uh, connected networks connected intelligent uh, you know devices and so on if i look at all the different technology enablers that we expect to be part of the 60 network and and the resulting complexity of the network which i believe uh, professor huzur also talked about uh, it's easy to imagine that the attack surface is also going to increase so what are we looking at here uh, increase in threat actors increased attack surface it's a it's a it's a marriage made in heaven for for hackers so what we really need is a is a network which is resilient Uh, to the expected increase in number of attacks um and that is my first challenge how do you make the network resilient uh, for these attacks uh, this is where security operations uh, come into play and to me security operations in a 6g network is going to be a huge challenge uh, we have traditionally had you know the centralized soc uh, as they call it security operation center uh, which um collect data from different sources within the network if they correlate the data they come up with certain uh, you know uh, estimations and they declare whether there is an incident or not and once the incident is there they invoke their automated playbooks to you know respond to those incidents is that sufficient um, probably not we may we may see certain enhancements going on there where these security operation centers may actually be distributed uh, may actually be more hierarchical in nature where uh you know they actually be part of the sub network as they call it i mean there is a talk about 60 being a network of networks so you're going to have sub networks and then they all talk to the bigger network possibly you're going to have a distributed uh, soc or a requirement for a soc uh, you know as a complement to this challenge uh, there is also the sub challenge here where uh just given the type of attacks that we are bound to see uh, and the innovations in the attacks uh, so to speak we also need improved security observation and monitoring capability um you need a much finer granular threat detection capabilities which probably run on the edge uh, and feed these local socks as i mentioned earlier um one of the key tools that we know today uh, for security observability and monitoring is what's called as evpf enhanced um berkeley packet filter uh enhanced packet ebpf is, is is nothing but a kernel technology which enables us to dynamically program the kernel uh it allows you to create a sandbox 
uh, sort of like a virtual machine. Uh, you can install programs into the sandbox and you can plug it into, let's say, a network interface of that node. What this allows you to therefore do is uh, monitor the network uh, interface, right? You, you, it allows you to uh, detect uh, mal, you know, uh, malicious uh, packet, for example, potentially DDoS type of, type of attacks. Um, very important. And also eBPF also has this capability to, to report the result back to the application in the user space. So therefore, you can also you know, think about this as complementing your SOC. So whatever you detect, maybe you know, if you can fix them right there within the program, you do it. If not, you report back to the SOC and SOC will be able to uh, handle those threats and you know, invoke the necessary response. So all in all, what I'm saying is uh, the, the, uh, the, you know, the uh, ability for the network to handle these attacks, uh, load down the stack, uh, without impacting the application, so to speak, I think there's a key problem that we need to solve. Uh, just for folks who are you know, aware of uh, cloud native technology, what I'm basically saying is you have all these applications running in the pods. Think of a technology where these attacks are filtered down at, at layer two or layer one. So the, the applications are never, you know, not even impacted by this attack. So I think that's a that's the first challenge, which I think uh, uh, we need to think about. Uh, apart from all the different things that Professor Huzur and the team talked about here, I think the network resiliency is, is an important topic. Now, the other uh, you know topic which uh, I think uh, the previous speaker also referred to the zero trust. Now, I would phrase it in a slightly different way. How you know with the expectation that network is going to be open, disaggregated, uh, and therefore cloud-based, uh, how do you prevent uh, insider attacks, how do you prevent lateral movements within the network? Uh, I think that's going to be a challenge. We do know certain solutions today. Uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, we have these Kubernetes namespaces, which will help you, you know, create a micro perimeter. But is that enough? How do you have this concept of an end to end zero trust, where it is not just about the, uh, the virtualization layer, we also need to have zero trust, let's say for the software, right? How do I make sure that these images that I download are trustable, right? Uh, how do I have a hardware which is trustworthy? So this whole concept of end-to-end -end trust, end-to-end uh, -end zero trust, I think is an important problem. Uh, we also had a question on the chat earlier. Uh, how, how, how do we think zero trust, trust is going to evolve in 6G? And that's probably a you know, very important problem statement that also we need to address. Um, and, and of course, um, many other things that our previous speakers talked about. Uh, but to me, uh, apart from all of those, I also would like to focus specifically on uh, uh, maintaining the resiliency of the network uh, in the in the face of increased attacks that we expect, uh, and also the concept of end-to-end -end zero trust, where we apply zero trust uh, across all the different layers of the stack and across different network elements of the network. Uh, those would be my uh, two uh, initial thoughts, uh, Professor. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think uh, uh, you highlighted some of another uh, important dimensions of uh, uh, the need, how you perceive the security operations is going to evolve uh, towards network resiliency and uh, uh, the uh, how do you per se uh, ensure zero trust when you look at multiple entities end to end as well as from over the stack uh, across. So I think uh, uh, I thank all the uh, initial, I mean, the speakers for the initial comments. Uh, some some of the questions that just quickly come through my mind, I can just try to go around if uh, uh, you are willing to take it up. Uh, it will be interesting. Then we'll go to the questions from the audience. Uh, so uh, one thing which I would like to probably uh, ask uh, uh, Ms. Tola is that, uh, how do you uh, foresee uh, security and performance uh, aspect that has been tabled, um, specifically with respect to ORAN? Uh, uh, uh getting you know uh shaped up or how, how how do you perceive that it will be uh addressed sorry <clears throat> uh, so you are referring spe specifically to the performance aspect of the of, of security uh, as i yeah. said earlier um it, to actually to only keep pace already for a few General gener generations of mobile networks, we are dependent on hardware ac acceleration, and uh, that needs to evolve. It also needs to become or stay sustainable. 
So uh, to, in order to be acceptable, or that, that's actually one other general general aspect that we have seen in the past, that security has been uh, dismissed in the past. Most of uh, in most of the cases because it was for some reason not acceptable. We have to make it acceptable, uh, and that always and that means for the for the for the performance uh, aspect. Yeah, we need sustainable hardware acceleration solutions, and that means. Also, in the face of a of an industry that becomes more and more virtual, so not dependent on hard on on hardware, so we need to solve that 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 conundrum. AL is, of course, maybe one buzz one buzzword in that in that in that area that we need to in that we need to enhance. And in that case, um, well, as a as a vendor, uh, vendors usually are not very keen on 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 standardization of their products. They want the customer to have one product, their own, of course, but uh, Nokia is also a, also a customer, and there we and there we see the same practice, uh, and that's why we agree that yeah, in order to uh, become and stay a a, a, a viable indus, industry, we have to depend more and more on more and more on standards, and those standards then we need to support in uh, uh, affordable hardware. So and and yeah, also we need we need we need we need to solve the problem uh, in a in a software defined world to still have access to those hardware acceler acceleration cap capabilities. Okay, fine. Thank you. So uh, uh, what you perceive is that when we devise or implement these uh, 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 mechanisms for. Uh, uh, encryption or for any kind of crypto function, it needs to be done uh, taking care into the hardware acceleration or yes. uh, uh, software acceleration. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Now, uh, just a question to Dr. Heyman. Uh, you, I mean, uh, when you talked about application uh, specific thing, one question that comes to me about when you talk about the intelligent radio, uh, how do you think that it's going to help uh, security from uh, uh, the 6G application for the 6G application? Okay, uh, uh, when you talk about intelligent radio, uh, so we need to have that concept of software uh, SDNization kind of thing. So, in earlier case, uh, in the, uh, you have the device and radio are integrated together. Now, uh, when they are uh, disintegrated, uh, like with your radio and your device are disintegrated, we need to, we can have, uh, we need to have bet better security model deployed, uh, then the algorithms need to be deployed different uh, from the the way we have been doing uh, from the uh, from the existing 5g kind of uh, devices so there uh, we need to have different kind of mechanisms so that maybe that concept of sdnizations will play a major role bring software defined radio and you bring the devices separately and then you go in yeah okay okay thank you uh dr prem uh one question to you because uh, there are uh, uh, elements of crypto elements, including uh, authentication and for uh, uh, key exchange you talked about. Uh, one aspect that comes is about uh, the concern that was uh, tabled earlier also in the keynote on the uh, privacy aspect of it. Uh, when huge amount of data, like when applications like health comes into picture, uh, what do you think are the what do you think are the crypto primitives that uh, apart from the PQC that you see as candidate or uh, way forward uh, that may you know, pan out in the context of privacy? Yeah, I mean, I uh, personally think that I mean, a lot of uh, crypto primitives, uh, they are at the experimental state where you can use them for doing some kind of uh, uh, operation on encrypted data, meaning uh, they can be used uh, meaning in such a way that uh, the data can be encrypted and it can be put on the cloud and they can work um, on this kind of encrypted data, which is called this homomorphic encryption. That is one of the things. And um, meaning there are various kinds of uh, questions which uh, arise when we talk about uh, meaning generic data or health data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, meaning which 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 do not fall under the ambit of PQC per se. So PQC is mainly only about encryption and uh, authentication. Uh, one is the uh, key problem. Other is this uh, authentication or signature problem. So these primitives uh, meaning they are. At, at, they are not being adopted widely, but there are some experimental kind of um, uh, meaning um, uh, meaning uh, systems where the health data, for example, has been encrypted and uh, machine learning algorithms have been run on them and so on. 
so these are these are beyond the peak, the, the ambit of pqc so these are some kind of uh, more complicated and sophisticated algorithms like this um, schemes like this homomorphic encryption which can kind of support operating on encrypted data so i think they may become relevant in this context of uh, privacy of this uh, sensitive data and in the context of 6g being um, used for doing such kind of computations yeah thank you thank you uh, uh, to uh, Ashin Anandar ji, sir, I mean, you talked about the growing uh, uh, expansion of devices and sensors. So, uh, how do you essentially foresee uh, the uh, security in the context of 6G there? Uh, yeah, uh, before, just before I come to that, you know, I would like to just, uh, one of the points that, of course, this will be relevant there also. Mr. Ba Nagendra talked about, you know, network resilience is one aspect he's talking about and because of the increase of the threat actors and the attack services. I think that that aspect is already a challenge even now and it's going to increase in the future. I think what's it has a lot of automation is to happen there. That is what has to happen. And when you talk of, and we talked of secure design also. So when we talk of that network resilience, I think this is where the design principles come into place that, you know, you have to start thinking of resilience as a part of uh, what is going to happen in the future and then design that. It, it's not that, you know, individual vendors are designing components of a network and then they design it, uh, you know, as per that particular uh, functionality of that component. But I think a system design way, the system and the requirements of the individual components for, you know, fulfilling the requirements of the system, the resilience part of it should be a part of the design. That's when, you know, you could have resilient networks. It's uh, otherwise, it's not that you try to build in resilience later on by getting components from others. And this is where the standards bodies uh, would play a very important role in the sense that they're like you mentioned that, you know, security is an essential requirement or, you know, and in, it, it is not only a function, it's security is a functional requirement. I'm not talking essential. It's a functional requirement of any system. So something like that resilience is also a functional requirement of any system. And that's where the standards body would come into place to say that, you know, how do I build a, um, the resilience into that? So that is an important part. This is just wanted to put my thoughts there in, into that. Okay. And then, uh, okay, we, the devices, yes, a huge plethora of devices that are coming in and the, the variety of devices that you would have. And all of them would not be of the same criticality. Uh, and that, that that the challenge is there how to have how to come up with the security requirements of those devices how to have you know you know vendors adhere to the security requirements how to adhere to the, the people the customers purchasing only the end incorporating only those secure devices that's one part and when you have so many devices now with the mobile networks currently we have imei and mcs and all of those identities are there so well established in the mobile networks that you know we don't really second guess we don't think about it but with so many devices coming in how do you have the identities and uh, is one challenge and this is where i think that also requires to be addressed that how do i have unique uh, identity mechanisms which are not alterable which are not tamper which are tamper proof is something that we have to uh, look at so i think this is a challenge that has to be addressed from a standards perspective and also from a i think you know they coming from government i think also maybe said there would be some uh, regulatory or some requirements that might have to be put in place to see that this happens and that's there but, but you know there's another point that uh, i would like to say that you know a lot of this at the edge might be having peer to peer communication that would be happening at the edge for a lot of uh, the thing happening and this is where the challenge would be for the lawful interception. Uh, you know, current networks in 4Gs and all, you, you have uh, mechanisms of lawful interception built into it. But when you have uh, 6G and at the edge, you have start communication having happening without coming to the core. And how do you actually deploy lawful interception systems so that the law enforcement requirements for lawful interceptor also fulfilled is something that I think the 6G should take care of. Okay, yeah, thank you. And uh, over to uh, Mr. Uh, Nagenza, one question. I was just seeing even in the question that was coming that is uh, was there in my mind is there like when we talk about zero trust concept that was started, uh, I mean, for quite some time now and being talked in 5G context, uh, uh, you did talk about uh, the highlighted about uh, the uh, zero trust ensuring uh, end to end, right? So uh, what, how, how do you see that it is going to uh, uh, you know shape up? 
I don't know, to be honest. And that's probably <laughs> to be. I, I want to be very, very uh, honest there. However, uh, typically when we talk about zero trust, uh, we say that uh, you assume that there is an insider in the network, and therefore you say that the the existing perimeter-based protection will not be enough. You need to have this concept of a micro perimeter, micro segment, micro segmenting, protecting critical resources, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera which is all good. Uh, and this, by the way, is the definition that's coming from NIST, uh, what is that, uh, 207 document. I would actually expand that a little bit. To me, zero trust can also mean that uh, the components that I use to build my network, the devices that I use to build my network, the hardware and software resources that I use to build, the, build my network, how do I know that it is coming from a trustworthy, uh, you know, not just the source, but they're also developed and you know, uh, etc. So I would like to expand the concept of zero trust a little bit. Now, uh, yeah, I'm kind of losing my thought a little bit. Um, the uh, you know, a lot of these secure by design principles, uh, supply chain security does take care of some of these software components. Uh, however, we don't have an end to end uh, you know uh, definition of a zero trust which actually considers all the different components here, and. And I think to me, that's going to be a big challenge. Uh, and also maybe one more thing uh, to what uh, Narendra Nath sir talked about earlier. Uh, one simple way or easy way to uh, enable zero trust is also through automation. And, and let me explain to you how. Uh, automation can potentially, we don't, we don't have it there today, but can potentially be used to, for example, uh, convert an insecure device, which, we, which comes from the factory into a secure device. Uh, you manage the inventory automatically right once the inventory is uh, built up and they get onboarded you also push secure configuration into the network right so they become trustworthy so this whole concept of zero trust has to be expanded at different levels uh, converting a factory provisioned device into a secure device in my view is also a you know a enhancement of zero trust because you're you're kind of converting an untrusted device into a trusted device so I think all of these needs to be uh, discussed holistically, whether it happens in standards or whether it happens uh, in uh, outside forums, I don't know, but yes. That's, yeah, that's uh, I think before we just uh, wind it up, I just want to ask only two questions. One is that uh, any of you can probably uh, respond to it. One is about what do we uh, see perceived since there is, uh, as uh, uh, we have enough time now to uh, move forward, looking from the research perspective, standardization perspective, uh, uh, at a global level contribution, what can be the priorities that that you see that we need to focus on? Uh, you know, like, for example, if we have to culminate this uh, discussion into certain kind of a working group later, how do you, uh, for the security itself, what will be the compartments on priority that you would uh, uh, suggest? The one, you see, I'll just pitch in shortly. See, one is an authentication, you know, multiple speakers in this panel have been talking about that authentication mechanisms. I think that is something, you know, authentication or identity or uh, okay. something uh, that we'll have to really focus on. Uh, right. That's, I think, that's where it has to happen. Especially, you know, when you talk of multi-factor authentication and all of that, we are talking, I think that okay. those all concepts have to be revisited. And then seeing and it, how, how do I come up with new fresh concepts about how do I ensure authentication, even and, for individuals? And, and, and also, how do you see the convergence when you talk about both the QKD as well as the PQC coming and then maybe at the edge or at the last mail you adopt or migrate the PQC and then you try out? I mean, uh, how do you see these two uh, things? Is, uh, one more thing. <laughs> You know, I think I'll leave yeah. it at that because uh, yeah, one thing, you know, as, as Dr. Urvashi Sinha had said, you know, we are investing in both. I mean, from NICS, right. we have Absolutely. projects both in both the streams we have invested. Absolutely. So I think we need to have a converged uh, yeah. uh, approach on that front. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think we need to have some study groups and working groups uh, to understand uh, these things, like specifically mm -hmm. from the security perspective okay. and uh, from the standardization perspective, like which one from which applications for which technology, how mm -hmm. those can be combined, and then specifically from Indian perspective, if you do for India perspective, how that is going to be deployed, all kind of things. So from the application kind of yeah. Got it. And, and only one more question: uh, How do you motivate more uh, participant from the student or the researcher community to? Uh, you know, because th that's where it's going to uh, pan out. How do we do that? I mean, uh, uh, I mean uh, we have to have more conferences, more presentations, <laughs> and, 
uh, more uh, talks okay uh, at uh, standardization level at different uh, institute levels we need to have more and more uh, Things. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the interest in the student community would be, you know, based on how, after I finish my PhD or whatever it is, what is the job I'm going to get? You know, exactly. As is there a future for me there in that? And that is where I think we'll have to show them. Yes, there is a roadmap for you. Right. And those roadmaps you can determine, you know, it's right. like this postdoctoral also, there should be research opportunity. It means that we have to create a strong labs uh, base in the country where research happens. Uh, in these areas, uh, that's right. where that would happen. And, uh, you know, participation and standards bodies is something international standards bodies where, you know, we start funding people so that they can participate on a long term basis is something that right. And the government is very actively considering. Right. I think the DOT also, uh, right. there's a proposal that's in, in, uh, mooted for doing yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, before anybody goes and participate in international standards body, they should work in the national standards activities right. like at the PSDSI level. Right. or in the national study groups that the TEC right. has created. And that has to happen. Right. I think I think there is kind of uh, touching the uh, timeline here. And uh, uh, I think there are a few questions there. I think just one or two. Uh, uh, Dr. Prem, there is a question that uh, comment from uh, uh, the, about the psych recent, uh, you know, uh, issue with the psych in the NIST. Yes, uh, I think maybe you may want to uh, comment on it uh, offline or uh, that is one thing. Uh, the question is basically, how do you see the post quantum standardization? Is it going to be a perpetual and hackathon? And answer to me, it also appears yes, it's an ongoing journey. We cannot uh, uh, just uh, you know uh, uh, be believing on that. I think I think we are running short of time. And Dr. Mani, what do we do? Would we uh, I mean uh, end this session now and uh, take the questions offline uh, to respond? Ah uh, yes, uh, Dr. Subhu, yes. Okay. Um, okay. I think uh, it was it has been an excellent session and sincerely thank all the uh, you know panelists uh, for their valuable inputs and uh, we uh, look forward to an engagement uh, further to you know streamline some of these things and take it further. Thank you all for uh, participating and audiences to sincerely to have been there and uh, you know uh, asking a lot of questions and things like. That. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for the Thank time you. and for the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.